Right, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, I'm Marcus Kilvin here, founder of Food Profits, and this lovely young lady over here is Anne Blackburn, who is the Customer Experience Director for the Stony Group. And what we're going to do in the next 40 minutes is we're trying to get you as much value as we possibly can do. So, I'm going to make a little suggestion, that is you make a few notes, that's okay. Now, just a little bit of a story about me. Um, for many, many, many years I worked as an employee. Um, for what I would describe as probably employees that just didn't understand me. And then a few years ago I got made redundant and set up my own business and I've been working for myself for probably about eight years now and I had many people working for me along that time who kind of I just didn't really get or just didn't really understand. They didn't seem as passionate as me, they didn't seem as engaged as I was, they just didn't seem like to do what I, what I wanted them to do. Even though I was actually paying them quite a lot of money at the time. And I struggled for years and years and years, quite painfully actually. And then something quite interesting happened um, not that long ago, and I discovered three drives of human behaviour. So three things that actually I was completely unaware of until that time. And then what happened was I actually started to incorporate that within the staff that I actually had working with me, and things just started to change and started to turn around. And I kind of couldn't believe really what happened. And what that resulted in is it resulted in the fact that I actually got people that were working for me that were energetic, enthusiastic, engaged employees. And what I'm going to do with Anne in the next 40 minutes is I'm going to share with you those three things that actually I learned and then started to put into my business. And I'm also going to share a whole ton of other stuff with you. So what I'd like to do is make as many notes as possible as we go through this. Now, if I was to ask a hotel owner, a pub owner, a restaurant owner, a cafe owner, or a coffee shop owner, what their single biggest problem was, they would say, staff. So I just want to ask you a question. Just, just show your hands for me, please. Who in here is an employee, gets paid a wage or a salary at the end of the month or the end of the week? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. And also, just for me, also, just pop your hand up if you are self-employed. You work for yourself, a little bit like me, um, and uh, you pay the employees that work with you. And hopefully you pay yourself. But if you've had probably many, many months, months that I have, you probably haven't had enough money to pay yourself. So, thank you so much for that. Okay, so... 80% of people, it's really, really quite high. And I just want to share a little story with you before I get into some of the meat today. And that is, I was working not that long ago with a lady, and I'll share with you, I won't exactly share with you where she is, because that would be unfair, um, but she is in my hometown, Nottingham, and um, we're chatting to her, and she sort of said to me, she said, oh yeah, Marcus, I've always got these staff problems going on. Always. And this is what she said. She said, you know what, Marcus, if I had my way, I'd sack the lot of them and start again. And I thought, hmm, that's a little bit hard, isn't it? Because if you just put your hand up a moment or two ago because you're an employee, that might seem quite unfair. I think you're probably fair to say. Yeah, and that is, it is unfair. And I was really curious about something because there was a day, whenever that day was, that those people were employed for their ability for their skills, because they were seen to be better than anybody else that was going along for that interview at the time. Young lady smiling, Danny, you can relate to this, can't you? And what I really wanted to ask, and I actually think about this today, is what happened between that day and today? And I might actually think about this as well, is was it the employee, or was it the employer? Something to think about. What's quite interesting is in our industry, only 20% of people worldwide enjoy going to work. Now is that frightening or is that frightening? Pretty frightening. And you might have your own reasons as to why that might be, um, but you know why? Why is it only one in five people actually don't uh, only enjoy going to work? And it's something that sort of I've sort of struggled with over the years. And I'm just going to share with you very, very quickly today, because um, our time is just going to fly today, is the three things that I actually discovered um, not that long ago. First of all, sensational staff have kind of three things, and this was a whole new thing to me, because I didn't really get this at all. And everybody wants to contribute, and that might sound like common sense, it might sound obvious, but actually I didn't kind of realise that. And by the way, you might want to write this down. Contribution is one of the ten human drives that we all have. 
so contribution for self. The other thing is contribution that is appreciated. Might sound like common sense again, but I have a great phrase that Adrian has down here, is common sense often isn't common practice. And the third thing is, three drivers, is actually your employees that work with you actually want to know the overall goal of your business. And that might sound really strange, it was really strange to me. Why? Because it's kind of like I thought it was my business, and I kind of thought, well, hey, hang on a minute, my goals and my visions, why do my employees that work with me want to know about that? Massive, massive education for me that was because I didn't realise that. So, I want you to write those down because it was really, really crucial for me. And I just want to share this with you. Um, some of you, I'm sure, know this. The number one reason that people leave our industry and go and work somewhere else. Do you want to know what it is? Lack of appreciation. Lack of appreciation. Please write that down. I was working with a um, cafe owner, um, he's actually got four cafes in Cambridge a few weeks ago. Lovely guy, got really, really high standards and he loves his people and he's got a great phrase actually, I love this, I'll share this with you today. He just says to the people that were with him, and you'll notice that I'm using the people that work with you, not people that work for you, because I'm a great believer in it's about working together, it's not us and them, it's not them out there. He's got this great phrase, he says to everybody, I want you to make beautiful food and go home happy. Make beautiful food and go home happy. It kind of paints a picture, really, doesn't it, for you? And what was quite interesting, I was working with him, and um, he never had meetings with his staff. He's got some great stuff, and again, frustration, frustration. And we just kind of put a little questionnaire together. We had three questions on there. If anybody wants to ask me what they are at the end, please come and see me, because this time is just going to fly today. Um, and what came back from that is actually nobody knew where he was going with his business. And this is a really important point. Please listen closely to this one. Even though it wasn't their business, they wanted to know where the business was going to. Because they then feel part of the whole business, more engaged. So, let me just share with you this. I'm going to talk quite, quite quickly. You can probably tell I can talk quite quickly anyway. Um, but I just want to share two words with you. On the screen behind me is the words competence and confidence. And I just want to share this because it's crucial. Because what happens is they feed off each other both positively or negatively. So for example, if you've got an employer or somebody working with you who isn't particularly confident, they aren't particularly competent. And if they aren't particularly competent, they're not very good at their job, they're going to shy away from things. Reason why? Because they aren't very confident. So they feed negatively, but here's the real rub and here's the great, here's the great bit of good news for us. Is they also feed positively. So if somebody becomes more confident about something, they become more competent, they become better at the job. So they feel more engaged, which I was going to talk to you about in a moment or two. And they feel better about the whole thing. And I ask you to take this away. Whatever kind of business you're in, whether you're a pub owner, restaurant owner, cafe owner, hotel owner, coffee shop owner, maybe you do something completely different. Think about this for a moment. Are you consistently critical? Or are you consistently complimentary? Are you consistently critical or are you consistently complimentary? Because it's going to make a massive, massive difference to those people that actually work with you. I just want to share this with you. If you want highly engaged staff that I describe as um, the five pillars of high performance, um, number one is staff want to feel safe. Again, something you might never have thought about, I know it's common sense, but again, common sense often is a problem practice. So if somebody doesn't feel safe, and that's the number one, it's going to be hard, it's going to be really, really hard for us. The other one in there is support of the boss and the, and the managers, so whether it's line managers, whoever has support, and the key word on that bullet point number two there is support, support. Now some of you might be going, yeah, okay, Marcus, but um, you don't know what my staff are like. And I ask you to think about this today when you go away from here. Because I often get people sort of say to me, yeah, Mark, it's already you talking about getting people to be encouraged and appreciated and the support and all the rest of it. Do you know what they're like? Kind of two things for you. The first thing is, if there were ten things they were doing and you thought that eight of them weren't particularly good, here's my suggestion. You focus on the two things that are good and you appreciate and actually compliment and support those two things that are good. Because what happens is then, you'll find a massive transformation. Focus on the good. The other point on that slide is, as I've just mentioned, the encourage and appreciation. Now here's something again I just want to share with you today, based on the last slide when I talked about confidence and competence, right? 
If you believe and encourage people, they naturally become more confident. Yeah, and you now know that if somebody's more confident, generally they'll be more competent. They're better at the job, they'll take more responsibility, you can empower them more, so they fit together. Number four, I touched on this being the three drivers of human contribution, and that is contribution is recognised and known by your employees for the business and where the business is actually going to. That's number four. And the last one, again, one of my passions, and I know Anna will talk to you about that in a moment or two, but training. Because so few people in our industry actually get training, proper training. And I don't mean that in disrespectful ways, someone will probably go, pull me up at the end, and that's absolutely fine, because I'll stand by my words. Now, here's something really interesting, again, going back to confidence and competence. You can build confidence by encouragement and appreciation. You get to build competence a whole lot more by correct training. So if you're not doing any training, it's always going to be difficult to build confidence and competence. And then you, like me as an employee, many, 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 many times, will kind of go, well, what's going on here? And we just focus on what I describe as the negative rather than the positive, because I'm all about positive and about believing in people and getting people to believe themselves. And I'll share this with you. Great phrase from a friend of mine a few years ago is, encouragement lifts people like hot air lifts a balloon. Great phrase. A lot of us don't do it. So I ask you again, are you consistently critical? Or are you consistently complimentary? Things to think about. If you actually put these five pillars of high performance into your business, what actually happens is you get positive, productive, passionate, profitable people who ultimately lead to happy staff, happy owner, profitable business, and raving customers of yours. What I'm now going to do is I'm going to hand over to Anne, who's going to share with you some deep, valuable insights and share some of her wisdom with you as well. Hi, thank you, Marcus. Can you all hear me okay? Great. Okay. Are you having a good day? Yeah. Good exhibition. Yeah. To see, isn't there? A lot, lot going on. We're competing with Premier Inn over there. We're making a lot of noise, which is fantastic, actually. They can make all the noise they like because they're doing a great job at demonstrating how they engage their people in their organisation. And I've just come from the other stage talking about the big hospitality conversation, which was so inspiring and really quite moving actually. Because we had we, we heard a series of talks about young people who have been attracted into the industry and what attracts them and what engages them and what motivates them to do, do a good job. So catch up on, on that one if you can catch their, uh, their notes. It's really, really inspiring. So dealing with staff problems. Just before we do that, we're going we're gonna to just go very, very quickly for the next 15 or 20 minutes looking at possible causes and then the impact of having staff problems on your business and then some very simple diagnostic tools and steps you can go through to actually deal with, with the problems you might be experiencing at the moment. Because it's quite complex really, a 20 minute session on dealing with your staff problems is really quite challenging when you don't know the, the individuals and the cause because there are many different contributing factors to this. So it's just a bit of a whistle stop to, to may hopefully give you some things of value you can then follow up on. A very quick 30 seconds about Sedona Group. We're an organisation that specialises in soft skills training to the hospitality industry. So we work um, on a one-to-one -one basis with, or with frontline teams or with leaders on a whole range of bespoke learning solutions. And it's all aimed at improving the performance of the people. It's tailored to meet the needs of your guests because we all have unique guests and the needs of your business because we all have different, slightly different business goals and business drivers and it needs to be very focused on your business results. There's a lot of conversations going on about how important people are to your business. We talk about this a lot, but how much do we really focus on investing our time and effort in improving the performance of our people? It has such a huge impact on the business if we do and we don't. And it's really interesting to walk into this exhibition and see 
see a lot of, of companies exhibiting here and to see the what I would call the people section squeezed into a little corner of the of the exhibition here when we're saying it's so important to our business to have our people adding maximum value to achieve their potential and, and, and a rewarding career in hospitality and to achieve the, the business goals as well. So very interesting. First slide. It's got two photographs in it. Take a look and see which of those you can relate to. So are you with the happy team that are having a lot of fun at work, who clearly look very engaged, very pleased to be there? Or the team that look like they're ready to do battle, that every day is a bit of a struggle? Or maybe you work with a, a, a few of each in those teams. And what if you were to swap those teams? into different environments, what would the impact be? We work with many different organizations, we have many different cultures and environments, and it's really interesting because we see individuals that have been written off and labeled as a problem or difficult employee in one organization, and then they pop up in another organization and they fly and they succeed and they're the, the rising star. Now, why is that? The four key influences on that are leadership, the environment, the culture, the way decisions get made, recruitment, and the level of training and, and support they're given. And leadership is a really key driver of the performance of your people, and we don't always, always recognize that. We don't always invest in our leaders and help them. I think hospitality is a great example of a sector that really pushes people up, promotes them very quickly, but maybe doesn't necessarily give them the right tools and techniques to, to perform well in that, in that leadership role. You might, have, might be familiar with the phrases, people join organizations and quit leaders and they lead as we serve. And I think those, we might be able to relate to those two. I know I certainly, I certainly can. Just very quickly looking at the impact of staff problems. It's a huge cost to our business to be allowing staff problems to continue without dealing with them. I mean, how much time do we spend sorting out people problems, sorting out the, the difficulties, the underperforming employees? Then we kind of just leave the people who are doing a great job to themselves because they're doing well, and then they leave because we've spent all our time dealing with those people who are not performing so well, and we lose our best people. It's very expensive to recruit and train and develop staff. It's a huge cost to the business if we don't deal with it and guests and other, other employees. Your whole employer brand is really important. If I start working with an organization, before I even go in and do any observation and talk to people and talk to employees, I look on the feedback sites and I look on TripAdvisor. And I'm not just looking at what the guests are saying about their experience with that organization. It tells me a lot about the organization and the culture and the leadership, what the guests comment on and the management responses. And employees do that too and I'm sure if you're if you're applying for a new job that's something you'll look at and it will tell you a lot between the lines about how that organization ticks, how they make decisions, what sort of culture it is. Is it an innovative culture? Is it an old culture? You know, is it in an empowering culture? Um, is it a young, dynamic culture? So it's a huge cost to you to, to not be dealing with those staff problems and to not nip those in the bud. And I think because it's often in the too difficult to deal with box, we kind of don't, or we store it up and then fling it at them at the end of year appraisal and wonder why we get you know, defensive reactions. One of the things that um, we're going to talk about briefly at the end is a tool that we have to, to download on employee engagement. There's been a lot of work in the last couple of years on employee engagement, and I firmly believe this is going to be the answer to um, dealing with, with problem staff, because it's, it's, the paper will give you all sorts of facts and figures about how business critical it is, and 
and, and 10 steps that you can do to implement in your business to engage staff. And just repeating some of the things that Marcus was talking about a minute ago, it really is, employee engagement is about getting an environment where your staff willingly give more. So it's taking motivation to a different level, giving them a deeper sense of purpose, really getting them to buy into your cause, what your business stands for, what it's passionate about, so that they want to do well for themselves and for you. And a couple of years ago, the government did this big study, if you want to have a look, it's called the McLeod Report, and there's a really good website called Engage for Success, which has got lots of information on it, and a video we might get a chance to, to show you later, which is just very brief. And it's, it's really, really interesting because when I had a look at that and then I looked at hospita the hospitality industry, it seemed to have an even greater impact and a, an even more immediate return. So I looked at hospitality companies that were really proactive in engaging their employees. They were also in the top 100 companies to work for. They had very strong employer brands. Their venues and hotels and restaurants were also in the top 10 TripAdvisor ratings and they were also those organizations making a lot of money and most profitable. So there is a correlation there and there's, I say, a, a, an interesting uh, document for you to have a look at. So, if you have a problem, how can you deal with it and how can you identify it? A, a quick and simple tool of um, looking at a staff problem, okay, if we take kind of leadership and, and, and environment and other things aside, it's often down to people or technical skills. So, we've got the words missing there, okay. okay. People and technical skills. So the technical skills are, you know, if you're laying a, bed, laying a table, um, making a bed, pouring wine, operating the computer, operating certain processes, all that goes in the, the technical skills. And we tend to focus our training on helping people improve their technical skills because that's easier to do. So it's easier to show them how to do those things. It's easier to buddy them up with somebody who's really good at that, to get them some training and to monitor their progress in that. The things that are sometimes more difficult to, to deal with are those that fall in the, in the people skills box. So if you've got people who are just not really making as much effort as you'd like, maybe their timekeeping isn't good, maybe they're not cooperative, maybe they're not following instructions very well, um, and they're just not getting on with the team, or they're upsetting customers, all those kind of things I would put in the people skills box. And the three things that everybody brings to work every day is attitude, behavior, and language. And so those are the things that you need to, to think about and focus on and, and deal with in the, in the people box. But identifying the cause is really important because sometimes when you look into, well, is it people, is it technical? Well, yes, it's people. It's not always, things are not always straightforward in that in that area. Um, over 30 years ago, I was put into my first management role, given a small team to manage. Um, I started off great, about a month into it, I had a, a, a member of staff who was, um, I thought was quite difficult really. I had kind of labelled him in the problem, in, uh, problem member of staff box. He was not very cooperative, he was missing some deadlines and some projects, his timekeeping was slipping a bit, and he just seemed difficult to work with. I got a colleague from another department to sit on one of our team meetings and give me her observation. I had asked him if things were okay, if he was happy in his work, yeah, everything was fine, didn't seem to be any problems. She went back to me and said, um, I think it's you. I think he's got a problem with you. And of course, initially, I wasn't in a feed good positive feedback culture then in the organization I was working with. I was like, no, me, really, are you sure? What, what, what have I done? I'm kind of, no, it's, you know, I'm, I'm me and he's a problem and, you know, he's, he's got to deal with this, I'm not going anywhere. So she took him out for coffee and we found out a bit more about the, the issues and he found me really difficult to work with. 
and he found me quite controlling and very sort of micromanaging. And he, he thought that I gave all the best projects to other other employees and had my favourites. And this was really, really hard feedback to stomach. Um, and so we worked through that. Um, and in, the, in his first few weeks um, of employment, he had made quite a, a fundamental mistake in his role, which had resulted in us refunding uh, quite a lot of money to, to customers. And I'd taken the rap from that from my manager, so he had said to me, keep a close eye on him. And that was my way of keeping a close eye on him. So I was scrutinizing everything I did, reworking some of his rework, and sort of keeping him, you know, um, doing slightly simpler kind of tasks which wasn't good at all, really. That didn't help him and it didn't help me. We'd had a problem, we hadn't dealt with it. It was a technical skill and we didn't really learn, we didn't deal with that retraining. And I let him down as a leader. Um, I hadn't had any training myself as a manager on how to tailor my style, on how to engage and inspire and empower other people. And it was all within a, a fairly kind of blame culture, which is not good for um, enhancing all your employee skills and maximizing their, their contributions. So I think what I'm saying is identifying the cause is really important because what started off as me thinking I had a difficult employee ended up with me realizing I wasn't a very good leader and I needed some, some help too. So if you've identified the cause, you then need to gather the evidence. You really need to find out and, and back up what you think your theory is. So observation is good, asking colleagues. Um, if, if you can, look at uh, guest feedback, if that, if that relates to that individual, history guest visits. Um, all those sort of things help to build up your evidence in your case to back up the theory of, of what you think is the is the problem. Photos are quite good as well. I know quite a few leaders who go around taking photos of their staff in action and videos and planting a few things here and there. That may or may not be right for you, but um, lots of things you can do. So you've got to have, you've got to have that, that, uh, that pool of, of evidence so you can have that what we call difficult conversation. I don't know if you've come across this saying, we teach people how to treat us. Are you familiar with, familiar with that? No? Okay. I think that's quite important to reflect on for a minute because if we allow things to happen, if we allow people to be continually late or for standards to slip, what is that saying about us as managers and role models of the, of the business? And what's it saying to other employees and potential potential employees? So I think what I suppose I could be saying what, what we get is, is is what we deserve. So we teach people how to treat us. So we have to have that difficult conversation. We can't let those those problems continue. And depending on what it is, is 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 how you how you might think about tackling it. I would always start with what's going well. So if that employee who is um, is not performing well has done something well, you need to recognise that first of all. So you might acknowledge how they dealt with that distressed customer really well the other day. But then you need to get into, well, the problem is on a Monday, Wednesday and Friday, for example, you're continually late and this is having an impact on the team and the customers. Why is that? And how can we support you with that? You need to identify and flush everything out and give them the opportunity to, to let you know what, what's behind that. Because there could be a number, of, a number of things that you can deal with very quickly and, and easily. And then you need to get some commitment to change. So I'm sure you're all familiar with SMART, objective, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and timely. You need to know, or the employee needs to know, that, that if that outcome is to continue and that behaviour, attitude, skill area is not going to improve, 
that there's going to be an outcome and you need to be very clear about that and when you expect that change to happen and what you're going to do to support them and how you're going to monitor and measure that and, and, and exactly what, what things you want and you want done and obviously you need to document that in some way because that will depend on the next steps that, that you take. So that's really a very, very quick kind of look at dealing with um, with staff problems. I think now we've got a little um, a little video to show you on um, on employee engagement, which is taken from um, it's on YouTube. If you want to have another look at it, I think it's also on the Engage but for Success website. Um, and um, Mark is going to talk about the downloadable tool as well. If you want to to, to look at that with further reference sources as well. So thank you so much for listening and uh, thank you for your time. Thank, thanks so much, Anne. Right, um, what Anne want, and I wanted to do today was we wanted to say thank you for coming along and listening to us today. And so we want to give you a gift. Um, so you probably won't hear this very often at a talk or a training day or a workshop or anything like that. Uh, but uh, just take your mobile phone out and switch it on. Yeah, Anne and I wanted to give you something to take away today. So every single person is going to actually get this. Um, we're going to give you um, a free gift. So all you need to do in a moment or two, um, when you've turned your mobile phone on, which you probably have, um, we believe in value, about giving value, and actually more value than people expect to receive. I heard a great phrase um, or great quote a few years ago, and it was from actually Tony Robbins. Some of you may have heard of Tony Robbins. Anybody heard of Anthony Robbins? Yeah, fantastic, right, great. And it was this. It was pretty much always give people more value than they could possibly expect expect to receive. And so Anne and I, we're not going to give you one gift, we're going to give you two gifts. And all you need to do is, I better tell you what you're going to get first actually before you do this. Um, there's two things we're going to give you. Anne mentioned a moment or two ago about her employee engagement top 10 tips. So we're going to give each and every one of you a copy of Anne and Sedona's employee engagement top tips. And also we're going to give you a copy of Food Profit's powerful short guide on staff your secret weapon. So all you need to do is just text your first name and email to the telephone number on the screen behind me. And in the next 72 hours, we will send to each and every one of you a copy of Anne's and Sedona's employee engagement top tips tool and also our Food Profit staff, your secret weapon, powerful short guide. So i just let you do that for a moment or two. I can see a couple of the girls in the back of Platinum Recruitment going, yes, quick, get our phone number in there. Thanks, girls, it's good. I'll just let you do that for a moment or two, and that'll be sent to you in the next 72 hours. Okay, so what I'm going to do now, just as Anne quite mentioned a moment, I'm just going to show you a, a two and a half minute video which sort of sums up what I've been talking about and what Anne's been talking about as well. It's not what you want to hear, is it? You want me to feel inspired within the values. Engage. Well, you know what? So do I. I want to feel like I'm part of an organisation that values me. Me, as a person. Because then I'll give you more of the real me. One who stays late when it counts. One who puts in the extra effort. One who cares about what they do. Not just a pay limitation. I know what you're thinking. He's not talking about my business. We do loads to keep our people engaged. But do you? Really? Or is it just lip service? There are 30 million employees in the UK, only one in three are engaged. That's a hell of a lot of work. Look around you. All sorts of people with more to give. Give your employees a voice. Listen to what they say. Let us know why we're here. I am not a human resource. I'm a human being. And whatever you do, make sure it's real. We can tell the difference. Engagement isn't something extra. It's what you do and the way you do it. It's how you survive and how you grow. The rest of the world isn't going to wait around for us to get it. And does this feed into the bottom line? What do you think? So create a place where people want to shine. Wherever they are, whatever they do, it's good for us, good for our employers, and good for the country.
Come on, Britain, get engaged. Microphone, sir. Uh, One moment. I think, oops. I think that it, I think the the challenge that a lot of business owners face, maybe one of them, is like, how do you? Isn't it risky letting employees sort of do stuff that you don't know how to control? They're going to do. It's like, is it easy to have people that do what they're told? Is it easy just to have people do as they're told? Okay. You could probably argue that that actually is probably a good idea. But actually, based on what we talked about earlier about the three drivers, actually about contribution of self, contribution to preach and actually to being part of the whole vision, then it's actually really important the employee understands where the business is actually going so you can kind of work together. I don't think it's about preaching, it's about how you can work. Um, I know you, you and I, I know preach it quite well. Um, I think for me, leadership, and, and if you want to contribute to this as well, leadership's changed over the years, whereas a few years ago, not that long ago, still in organisations today throughout the world, certainly a lot in our industry, is people are told what to do. It's kind of like, this is me, I'm the owner, that's what you do. If you look at successful people like the Richard Bransons of this world, um, if you look at Richard Branson, and we probably haven't got time to analyse it today, but he's very much about what I describe as collaborative leadership style. There's lots of different leadership styles, and that is kind of about empowering, actually working with people to actually do better. Um, I had the pleasure actually about two, oh, it's about two years ago, and I was actually on a course, a three-day course with Richard Branson and Alan Sugar. And um, what was quite interesting for me is actually when Richard Branson was having a bit of a chat, he was talking about actually engaging the employees and actually working with them, finding out what was the good things to do with the business. And I'll never forget the night, the last night we were with him actually on the, I think it was Sunday night. Um, he was going to fly to Australia on a plane, and um, he got asked the question, Richard, what are you going to do on the plane tonight when you fly off to Australia? And he said, I'm going to do what I always do. He said, the first thing I'm going to go and do is talk to the customers and the passengers on the plane, because I want to find out about what we do well, about what we don't do well. He said, then I'm going to spend the rest of the flight actually spending time with the co-pilot, the pilot, the captain, and all the staff to find out how we can work together and actually do better. And that's kind of what I'd, what I'd say. Thank you very much for your question. And do you want to share anything on it? Um, yeah, I think that it's a really interesting point. People need boundaries. So I think you need, with empowerment, you need some kind of boundaries, but some organisations are at one end of the extreme and the others have just too many rules, in my view. So if you've heard of Zappos, it's a great case study, a um, US company recently bought by Amazon, um, the chief executive wrote a book, Creating Happiness at Work. They put every employee through a two-week induction company and trained them on doing the right thing for the customer. That was all their training was about, learning how to do the right thing and make the right decisions. And they had, you know, empowerment at one end of, of, of the extreme. As long as they were doing the right thing for the customer, then they were going to perform well, they were going to have a rewarding job, they were going to make the company lots of money. And they did, and they are a phenomenal success, and now I was a then I walk into some hospitality companies and they have too many rules and processes that are sometimes a barrier to the employee doing a great performance. And sometimes they're a barrier to delivering a great guest experience when the employee wants to do the right thing by the customer, but certain processes are, are getting in the way. So I think although we're kind of a dynamic industry in hospitality, we just need to sometimes ask our employees, is there anything getting in the way of them doing an even better job? Because sometimes it's things we create or things we've always done because we've always done it that way and we're perhaps not aware of the actions. And employees won't tell you if they don't feel they have a voice, so you won't ever find that out. Thank you so much for the question. Yes, we'll take, take two or three more. I can see we're running out of time a little bit here. But you, met, you mentioned to me in the talk that one of the causes of staff problems could be recruitment. In what way do you think recruitment can be improved or developed so that you make sure that actually at that time you get the right person to continue through? Yeah. 
to yeah. leadership in that. Absolutely. It is really critical to get the right people. I, I believe in recruiting for attitudes, training for skills. So I think, you know, I, I just think I see that time and time again. Um, if they're not if they're not the right fit for your culture from the start, whatever training and development you give them, it's just it's just not gonna work. So I think it's better to put that effort in up front and really test out that attitude. Disney recruits in groups, first of all. So they are they, three at a time and they test out people's reactions to certain situations and certain conversations and see how they work together with, with other people. And there's lots of different things, you know, that put tests and ways in which you can, um, you can see how somebody's attitude, because it, it's not, you know, you can perform at, at an interview stage. A lot of hospitality organizations now give them a taster day or a taster shift. And then sometimes the team vote on those that they think. So if you've got a winning team in your organization, get them involved in the recruitment. I know some organizations get their best people on board to, um, to get them involved in the recruitment process because if they're a great person, they're not going to want to recruit a not very good potential employee because they don't want them to let down their, their winning team. So there's all sorts of things you can do, but it really is worthwhile investing up front. And um, I know many people who also go and find those people. So they go to the best employers, they go to their competitors who are best in class at what they do, and they find those great people. Do you think it's legitimately acceptable to put someone in a trial period? I think so. I think so too. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, this gentleman was just saying how difficult um, it is to get right people and is, is it fair to do that? And I, I think it is, personally. Um, it, it, you know, it, you soon see how they behave and how they react. I think actions speak louder than words. Yeah. You put someone in a trial for a week or two, yeah. it's only more than you know, an hour. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's fair enough. And if they want to work with you, they'll be happy to do that. I mean, if they're already in employment, that's quite difficult. You know, you need to, maybe it's just a short spell of time, or maybe they come to an event, or, you know, there's ways in which you can have a day off somewhere, and if they want to come and work with you. Um, you've got to get that right fit, because we all have cultures, but we don't, we're not always able to articulate them. It's not always able for the employee to, to learn what that culture is, is about as well. So I think that's, um, we all have ways in which we do things, and, and there's a, a, hidden, a hidden culture, um, and it's got to be right for both parties, otherwise it's just such a costly mistake, really. Um, you know, you're going to get a certain amount of churn, but getting the right people in and getting them effective, a lot, a lot of uh, companies think, well, you know, they're only going to be here, that's not really what they want to do, hospitality, but I'll get them in, they seem like they could do a good job, we need, we need the staff, we'll get them in, they'll be here for a year or two, so that'll be fine, and, you know, I'm sure they'll do the best job while they're here. Well, actually, why wouldn't you, even if they're only here, here uh, for a year, why wouldn't you want them to be adding maximum value to your employment? Um, and if they're great, and you have to, um, and, and they go, maybe they'll come back. You know, that, that very often happens in hospitality, they go off and, and then they return. And then they're a great mouthpiece for your brand and your organization. They're great to work there. I think the pub test you've probably heard about is a great, you know, if, if, if people go out and they talk about what they do and who they work for, and they're proud to talk about that. When you ask somebody, who do, what, who do they work for, what do they do, and it all goes quiet and they don't really want to talk about it. A few questions. Sir, you want another question? Peter Leader, who used to be the um, general manager of Gen Eagles, and was a couple of the months and I was talking about recruitment, and front of house staff, the second interview was done at the person's home. So they actually went to the person's home, they were talking about front of house staff, people who knew being hospitable and welcoming, what better place to interview? Thank you, thank you very much. Just a couple more questions, and then we will uh, wrap up. Anybody else? Okay. Is there anything you're doing that's particularly working for you, or you want to share, maybe? <laughs> no? Okay. 
Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so, so much for listening to myself and Anne. Um, we'll just leave you with this one. Um, Anne and I, we we'll have a bit of a mantra, and it's this. For today and every day, be the very best that you can be for yourself, for your staff, and for your customers. Thank you so much for listening. Keep it for me.